Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks to the FSF for hosting this. Uh, thanks to Rick and Charles for managing the AV. Uh, it's been a long conference, and I'm sure all of us are equally exhausted. Uh, so I'm glad that we get to close it off by discussing some of the uh, principles that underlie a lot of the free software movement. So today I want to talk to you about saving democracy with the web's infrastructure. My name is Danny. I work at the Freedom Box Foundation. We're based in New York, and we try to build technology that immortalizes freedom in the infrastructure of the internet. Okay. Right now, I think that we are at a decisive point in the history of democracy. Reflect on what's happened in the past few years with the Brexit referendum in the UK, with the 2016 election here in the US, and all of the turmoil that spread throughout the world. In India right now, there are even a lot of controversies surrounding voter manipulation in their national general election set to take place next month. Our technological prowess can defend democracy or it can destroy it. We have to decide which it will be. After 2016, I think that we got an indication of the direction in which we're headed, uh, but that was only three years ago, not 30 years ago. It's not too late to change course. Uh, so what I want to do is give you a brief history of representative democracy, just so we can understand how precious this gift is that we've all inherited. One of the earlier theorists of representative democracy, Aristotle, he was known for a lot of things, but one of his ideas was that political communities are supposed to be designed in a way such that they help their citizens flourish as individuals and, and that they help the citizens develop a kind of character called civic virtue. Right? It's supposed to be possible for someone in a political community to uh, cooperate with others in that same community constructively. Now, this tradition kind of fell off the radar for a bit, but there were some uh, Italian political theorists in the Renaissance, and Machiavelli in 1517 does some writing. He does some writing that's separate from what he says in The Prince and all of the stuff that we've all heard about him. And one of the things he says about uh, representative democracies is that conflict is a good thing, right? It's good for citizens to have conflict, but we need to have institutions that help people channel their discontent productively. Right. Maybe he would have something to say about the referendum that took place in the UK or any of the recent uh, white supremacist protests and acts of violence that have happened uh, in the United States and in New Zealand. I'm not so sure that we've lived up to that ideal. James Madison in the United States, he, he wrote uh, under a pseudonym in the Federalist Paper number 63, republics derive their power from the people through elections. And so if there's any question about whether or not the election was fair, or the events leading up to the election were fair, then there may be a question of legitimacy in the republic. Okay? So uh, this brings us to the present. We have a, a political theorist at Princeton named Philip Pettit. He's one of the preeminent theorists of republicanism and representative democracy. He says that republics need a contestatory citizenry, right? just like Machiavelli. We need to have contestation. We need to have disputes with each other. But we need to do it in a productive way because that's what creates laws that's what creates governments that reflect our shared interests. Okay. If that contestation either stops because people aren't voting anymore or it isn't productive, then we're not going to have governments that really represent all of the people. So these are the components that we can glean from that very, very brief overview of the history of what we've inherited. We need to have a, a kind of character as citizens, which they would call civic virtue. We need to participate in politics, and we need to do it in, a, in, in the right way. Right? It's not enough just to have uh, your violent protests. Contestation, it's an important part. We need to have disagreements. And our electoral systems are only legitimate if we vote, and if those votes themselves are viewed as legitimate. 2,000 years of collective effort created the, the representative democracies that we have today. If you're an American, you were born into it. If you were uh, British, you were born into it. If you uh, were Indian and you were born fairly recently, you were born into it. Uh, there are countries throughout the world that have inherited this, and I don't want us to take it for granted. In the 21st century information society, we need to be the stewards of this tradition. Otherwise, it may be threatened and there may be some real damage done to it. Democracies are shaped by the flow of information. How many of you have read the news about 
voter manipulation in the United States about the 2016 election, right? And how you can be micro-targeted on your newsfeed based on some data that somebody gathered about you. And now people who otherwise weren't going to support someone who's bigoted are feeling like they maybe should. Information affects what happens in a democracy. And information is important to all of those things that I told you. How can you develop the kind of character that citizens need to work with each other constructively if you're constantly being fed very extreme information on a news feed that's designed to be addictive and that's designed to uh, push us towards the more and more extreme ends of views because that's what gets the clicks, that's what gets the shares. It's the intensity of it all. How can we participate in politics constructively if we're constantly being battered with propaganda, misinformation campaigns, and there are all of these fake bots on Twitter as, has, as happened in 2015 and 2016. Contestation is important, but it needs to be done constructively, right? We, 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 we can't have acts of violence. We can't have confrontations um, of white supremacists and peaceful protesters. And again, how legitimate can we say our institutions are if we feel that the leader was elected illegitimately, if we feel like there was a little bit of cheating that happened with the flow of information. The democratic tradition is being tested by our information technology. Right? I know I'm preaching to the choir saying that to this audience, but I really want to capitalize the stakes here. It's not just that one bad person won a big election in 2016. It's that an entire tradition throughout the globe is being tested. So let's look at exactly how it has been tested. In 2016, before the election that I've been talking about, protest intimidation took place. On various social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, location data was shared on the posts posted by activists. And so when there were activists for the Black Lives Matter movement who were trying to organize a protest, and they were using the hashtag Black Lives Matter, there was a third party company called Geofedia, which gathered this, uh, these posts in real time and uh, analyzed their location data in real time. 500 law enforcement agencies in the United States were paying this company to get that location data so that they could find the protesters as they were starting to develop a protest. And then what happens next is, is what really gets me. What happens next is they use facial recognition technology of the pictures that are posted on social media to find the people with outstanding warrants. And now they have an excuse to arrest somebody who's just peacefully protesting. You arrest that person. Everybody's thinking, why'd this, why'd this person just get arrested? They didn't do anything wrong. Maybe I'm going to get arrested. I'm going home. Now the protest has died. Voter manipulation in the United Kingdom, the Brexit vote, uh, there was a lot of uh, questions before the Brexit vote about what happened to the website where you can register to vote and get information about voter registration. That website was taken down by some attacks. And so the deadline for registering to vote was actually extended because of the uh, effect of those, uh, of those attacks. And then there was also information uh, manipulation that happened on social media, and that might have changed the outcome, okay? And even if it didn't change the outcome of the vote, it definitely raised questions about the legitimacy of the decision. Another one, in Turkey, this is an example that uh, has kind of fallen off the radar. Uh, in, uh, in April 2017, April 29th, 2017, the Turkish government actually decided to ban Wikipedia because Wikipedia was uh, publishing articles that suggested that there were some links to state-sponsored terrorism in Turkey. And a Turkish court actually backed the decision to censor an encyclopedia. In Mexico, the government hired a, uh, a cybersecurity uh, co uh, consultancy called the NSO Group and asked them to find vulnerabilities in widely used technologies like iPhones and spy on activists, anti-corruption activists, human rights lawyers. Now, how can, the, 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 how can we actually fight corruption in government if the people who are doing it uh, are being listened to by the microphones on, on, on their mobile phones? Right? And how can we, any of us, feel brave enough to do it ourselves if people are, are disappearing because of this kind of surveillance?
Okay? And of course, there's the story about Cambridge Analytica in the United States. What more do I need to say about this? Uh, there was, to this day, real questions about what happened. Was there foreign interference in our election? Was there domestic interference in the form of voter manipulation? In India, WhatsApp is a uh, very dominant uh, platform. And WhatsApp is used to share a lot of uh, political information. In, what, in, in India, whenever there's, a, uh, whenever there's a mob, whenever there are people who are killed in mobs, one of the first places you look to is WhatsApp and see, was somebody forwarding in batch a bunch of uh, fake news messages, so to speak? Right. WhatsApp is usually linked to a lot of these incidents in India, and that's because of the, the fact that the app is designed to make information viral. Right? And when a platform is designed to make information viral, you can forward a message to an infinite number of people. You can, um, and, and you can't turn off the, the feature that puts you into group chats that you didn't want to be a part of. And so when the BJP, the, 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 the political party in India, decides to make 8,000 different group chats uh, throughout India and put different people into those groups and feed them different kinds of information, there are real questions about whether or not we can trust the information that we're being fed. And so that's exactly why uh, the two people I work for wrote an article about gaming elections in India. Their elections start next, next month. Okay? We have to ask ourselves whether or not that democracy is going to be jeopardized. Now, thankfully, WhatsApp actually did implement some changes to uh, its platform in the, the months after all of this uh, rage directed at them. But there are still questions about whether or not we can trust platforms like that. And I also want to acknowledge what happened in New Zealand. Now, there, there is never a unitary cause of a tragedy. right? So it's hard to say that as one New York Times editorialist says, this was a mass murder of and for the internet. Right? However, what we do know about the person who committed this act is that he was a part of those extreme corners of the internet which promoted violence. And we do know that those extreme corners of the internet that promote violence are created, are, are grown, are, are fed by those news feeds that I keep talking about, which push extreme and intense information towards us, and which push and ads that are paid by people in these far-right groups. Right? So I think that we should at least take a moment to reflect on the state of the internet and how a large number of unintended consequences led to a serious tragedy. All of this leads me to, to observe that the internet democratized access to information. Anyone can get information on their phones, on their computers, but not anybody can produce it and decide how the structure of the information uh, looks and decide how information will be shared um, at, at the level of, of infrastructure. Information, and tra uh, in, information transmission and production are controlled at the center of the network, right? And that's because we have uh, Two, two parts to, our, to, to any network. Right? I'm going to explain this for, for those who don't already know. Computing today consists of clients and servers. A client is something like a smartphone or a laptop. This is what you use to send messages to people, read, read articles on the internet. The server is what's at the center of the network. This is what's feeding all of the information to other people and what's hosting all of the data at the center. As long as we rely on those servers at the center, we will be at the whims of the people who design the software on those servers. Okay? And as you can guess, most of the time, the software on those servers is proprietary. We can't actually inspect it. So the servers are at the center of the web. We have a centralized network infrastructure. But of course, we don't control what's at the center. They do. So to regain control, we need to re-decentralize the web. We need to try to create a structure for the uh, internet that looks more like that diagram up there. Right? We need to put up more nodes where people can pass their information from point A to point B. But why did the web centralize in the first place? Okay? Now, we're, now, now we're starting to get to the technology. PCs created a revolution. Personal computers created a revolution, and they displaced something called mainframes. mainframes were these large computers that were the size of, of a room. And people thought 
you could never convince somebody to buy a smaller version of that and put it at their home. This is a toy for hobbyists, but eventually PCs did. PCs started looking like this. This is uh, an IBM machine running MS-DOS. And the interface of this looks a lot like the terminal today. It's just text. You interact with it by typing in commands. Now, PCs really revolutionized computing once the Macintosh uh, was released in 1984. This device was known for having one of the first graphical user interfaces. So now you can take your mouse and point and click at things. This made the device not just one for experts and not just one for hobbyists. So they caused a revolution in computing. But this never happened for servers. Servers remained giant gargantuan machines at the center. Why did the clients enter the home, but not the servers? Why do we all have home computers, phones, but we don't all have servers at home? Well, I'm going to propose two explanations. Now, this isn't exhaustive, but these are the two reasons that come out, uh, that come to my mind when I, when I really reflect on uh, the history of computing. The first is inaccessible hardware. People weren't sold hardware that was marketed as a server that you can put at home. And the second is opaque user interfaces. There really wasn't a lot of development of server operating systems that are easy for anyone to use, right? Nobody did what the Macintosh did in the 1984 to servers for a long time, okay? Now we get to Freedom Box. Freedom Box is a simple private server that tries to solve both of those problems and put servers in the homes of people so we can decentralize the web, okay? Here are the basics. Freedom Box is a free software uh, private server system that's made with our software, which is totally free, and hardware, which costs $30 to $100. Now, what our software system does is it makes it easy for anyone to build and use and configure their own server. Right? What it does is it offers 20 plus applications and digital services that you can host yourself. So if you're in India and you don't want to use WhatsApp, you can make a Freedom Box, host your own chat server uh, on uh, one of the applications called Matrix, and use that chat server on your, uh, on your Freedom Box with your smartphone, with your desktop, and with all your friends. And we're designing this for anyone. It's not just for hackers. It's not just for people who have a lot of technical expertise. Now, it's true that it still isn't perfect, and it, it, it does require a little bit of initiative to really figure out. Uh, but our aim is to make it easy for anyone to use. Okay. That's going to be pretty hard for any network appliance, as we'll, we'll get into. So let's talk about the hardware really quickly. We want our hardware approach to be universal or neutral. We want it to be possible for this system to work on any hardware. And so that's why we picked, that's one of the reasons why we decided to make it based in Debian. That's because we want it to be compatible with most old laptops and desktops, and it is. I could turn most of the laptops in this room into Freedom Boxes. We also wanted to specifically target inexpensive hardware, so we build our system for single board computers, like the Raspberry Pi. A single board computer is, a, is uh, about the size of this box, right? Thirty to one hundred dollars. That's all it costs. All right, and here's and here are, are those ten single board computers. We make it easy for you to download the, the software for each of those. And this is all the hardware you need, right? You just need the single board computer, an SD card. That's where your storage is going to be. Uh, an Ethernet cord and a power cord. All right, so now let, let, let's talk about the user interface. The user interface is democratized. We want it to be designed for non-experts. We don't want there to be a high barrier of entry. It's simple. If you want something, you should be able to get it by pointing and clicking, not typing in a bunch of commands. Okay? And it's streamlined. We try to automate whatever can be automated so that the user doesn't have to deal with a lot of the steps in between wanting something and actually having it. Okay? So, Here's what the first boot looks like. You have your private server, you plug it in, and you get one button to start setup. So you click that button. You enter in your username, and you enter in your password twice. Setup is complete, okay? That, 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 that should take around 30 seconds. So now you can install some apps. This is what the apps page looks like, all right? 24 apps. Um, we have a, an application for file sharing. We have an application for blogging. IkiWiki, you can host your own website on one of these, actually. Um, we have an application for chat, Matrix, that's one I use, MediaWiki. You could actually host uh, your own wiki, just like Wikipedia. Uh, we have a, a VPN client, Provoxy, that's a proxy that filters out ads. 
and trackers on your browser, a calendar, you can have your own calendar server that your uh, devices can all synchronize to. Um, we have a meta search engine as well. We have an RSS and we have Tor. There, there, there's a number of features. The system options, uh, we have a lot of options here. You can back up your system as well. You can uh, use an app called Dynamic DNS to set your own free domain name. I'll be getting into that later, but we make it easy for you, or as easy as we can, uh, for you to access your Freedom Box when you're not at home, okay? So let me just uh, show you. This, this is what uh, an installation looks like. You get to the page of the app and you just click install. And it, and it automates it for you. It just installs the application and within a few minutes you have a server for uh, whatever service you're interested in. All right, now here's one uh, example of what it can do, okay? Because it's, it's true that we have uh, more than 20 applications, but here's specifically one of the use cases. Uh, if you install Matrix on your Freedom Box, you now have a chat server, okay? With uh, Matrix, you can download the client application called Riot, right? Riot is an application for iOS on the iPhone, Android, uh, Fdroid, uh, there's a web app, and there's a desktop app. So anywhere that, you, uh, that you, would, you would do your computing, you can download this client, okay? So you have this app. You can use this, uh, this Riot app to have uh, a discussion with your friends, have a group chat, even have a phone call with them, and you can encrypt the room so that all, all of your conversations are private. And I mean, take a look at this. This is actually a pretty nice user interface. So you're not only hosting something at home, but you get to enjoy using it. Right? That's one way that we can actually replace one of these large platforms that uh, has enabled a lot of uh, those threats to democracy. So uh, at the, the, the station out in the hallway, I had a demo instance, and I told people to go to libraplanet.freedombox.rocks. We give free subdomains on top of freedombox.rocks. And so if Charles wants to have his own uh, Freedom Box, he can do Charles F dot freedombox.rocks, and now he has a free domain. And he, he doesn't pay anybody for this. Uh, so I, I set one up for this weekend. All of you can, you can pull out your phone and, and check. You won't be able to log in, but you'll see it pops up, libraplanet.freedombox.rocks. Uh, and libraplanet.freedombox.rocks is actually running on a single board computer. Uh, that's a picture of the single board computer that it's running on. It's under my bed. There are two wires, right? One leads to the power outlet, one leads to the router. Usually we, we put them in plastic or metal cases, but in this case I actually just left it in a cardboard box and I just cut holes into the side. But, but it, if you go to libraplanet.freedombox.rocks, you'll see a website. That website is being hosted on, under my bed. It's that easy. I paid for the hardware once and that's it. That's the only money I had to expend. Okay, but can I buy it? I, I told you you can make it. I told you you just need the software and you just need the, the hardware and it should be easy. Freedom Box was launched in 2011, and people have always asked us at conferences, when can I buy the thing? I don't want to make it. Shouldn't it be easy? Shouldn't it be easy for someone to just sell an all-inclusive kit that you can just buy and plug in? All it would need is the Freedom Box, of course, one or two wires, the power, the, the, the power cord, the Ethernet cord, and uh, an SD card that comes with the operating system already flashed. Well, it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, that you can buy a kit. Uh, I'm proud to announce that the Freedom Box Foundation has struck a deal with a hardware manufacturer called Olimex. Uh, and for 82 euros, you can buy a Freedom Box, get this server shipped to your house, plug it in, and go. That's it. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's coming soon. The Pioneer Freedom Box Home Server Kit. Now, we call it Pioneer because you're gonna be some of the first people to, to buy your own home server kit. These sorts of things don't really exist on the market, so there will be some friction in the beginning, right? We expect for there to be some friction, and we, the kind of consumers that we hope buy this are people who have an each one, teach one mentality, someone who's willing to engage with the details and help us perfect it, help us get better at this, okay? Uh, and, and so th th this is what it includes. We'll get down into the details. It includes a single board computer called the Lime 2. It's open source hardware. It has a processor with one gigahertz of processing power and um, it has one gigabyte of RAM. For reference, this is about as powerful as a smartphone from 2012. Uh, and that's all you need, really, for your own home server. You're not trying to serve a million people. 
with your website. Oh, you're just trying to serve your small community. Uh, it's in a metal case that comes with a Freedom Box logo on it. Uh, we have a battery. This is a pretty cool feature. There's a uh, lithium polymer battery that comes with it so that if your power goes out, for four to five hours, the thing will continue to run, right? Uh, I live in an apartment in the Bronx, and in the Bronx, uh, you know, there are a lot of old buildings, and sometimes the power goes out if you run two appliances at the same time. I don't have to worry about my Freedom Box turning off because there's that battery there. Uh, there is a gigabit Ethernet, Ethernet interface. Um, there's a SATA, SATA drive support, um, and there are some USB ports as well. It comes with a 32 gigabyte uh, micro SD card with uh, pretty good read and write speeds for those of you who are interested. Uh, and of course, an Ethernet cable and a, a power supply. That's going to cost you around $93. Okay? Now, again, you can still build one yourself for around $50 if you want. Uh, but this is one of the options that we want to offer uh, to anyone who's interested. This is the website you go to if you want to order. They're not accepting orders yet. They're going to start shipping probably in April, right, within a few weeks. But uh, we're going to post this on the internet, post this on social media. But this is the website that you go to. If you go there right now, you can just enter your email address and they'll notify you once they, once they release. So you can be one of the first people to grab one. Uh, so, I want to thank our core team of developers, the volunteers and partners and community who made this possible. Uh, Sunil Mohan Adaba, our core developer. Uh, Joseph Nuthalapati in India. James Valeroy here in the US. Uh, Robert Martinez, AKA Emre, he's our designer. Uh, and then people uh, who came before me uh, in the position that I have, like uh, Nick Daly, James Vasil, other people from uh, the early days of the project, really, I, like I said, we've been doing this since 2011. Eight years of, of work brought us to this moment where we can say it's ready for you to buy it. So uh, a lot of credit goes to those people who built it up to this point. OK, so that's, that, that's really the, the gist of the talk. But I, I, I really want to reflect now on what is the achievement of the post-2016 attention towards data and privacy. After 2016, all of the mainstream media outlets started to write more about how bad it is that Facebook has so much influence over the flow of information in our democracy. And there were some people who started tweeting, hashtag delete Facebook. Right? And there were some people who even deleted Facebook. Yeah, right, great. Uh, but really what we achieved after 2016 wasn't perfect collective action, because these platforms are still used, and they're still doing harm, they still exist. Right. What we instead achieved was a consensus about an idea. Right? And that idea is that our technology has been bad for democracy. People no longer just say, oh, it's fine. It gives me free services. Why wouldn't I use it? Everything is so much easier with Facebook. People now understand, no, it has consequences. It has been bad for democracy. Okay. We have a challenge now. We need to capture this moment. Right? We can't let it slip. We have to turn that belief into action. And those, those of us in this room who've been a part of free software for enough time uh, and, and, and who have the knowledge about this to, to really be the pioneers that we want to purchase this kit. The people in this room, you're the ones who I want to purchase this kit. Start talking about decentralizing the web. Start hosting your own server. Right? Start educating your colleagues about alternatives to these major platforms. Because now they at least believe that it's worth doing. They just don't know what to do next. Right? And that's up to us. So here's an example of what happens when people accept the challenge of taking things into their own hands. Uh, Freedom Box has a pretty large presence in India. And in 12 villages in rural India, Freedom Box is being used to provide internet routing and digital services to entire villages. Right? Think about that. We built a free software system over the past eight years mostly written by volunteers throughout the world. And now that software is being used to provide digital services with freedom to the developing world. Okay. This is what happens when people act on the news that they read. This is the example I want the rest of the world to follow. They show that with enough work, some pioneers can make a big difference. Freedom Box is just a tool. It's important, but it's not going to save democracy. And if you read the description to this session, you know what I said at the end of the description. Freedom Box itself isn't going to save democracy. You will. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, so the reason so many people showed up, we have a raffle, it's true. Uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know, we're, we're actually raffling off the hardware that you will be getting with your, uh, if you buy the kit. It's an Olimax single board computer. Uh, that's the Lime 2 right here. We're, off, we're, we're raffling off three of them. That's the, we're giving the computer and the case. Uh, and I have a little letter for the winners so you uh, know what to do once you get it. All right, so we're going to have three winners. Let's see. All right, first winner. Jamie, uh, Jamie Romenthal, Permenthal. That's you? Okay, congratulations. Yep, that is indeed you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. There you go. All right, two more chances. Okay, next one is uh, Dave Ralk. Dave Ralk? Is there a Dave Ralk? No? All right, and then we're going to pick another one. That's all right, people knew. All right, Taya Huber. Hey! Hey! There you go. See, see, th th this is what this is what happens when you show up, all right? <laughs> okay, and the last one, last one is uh, Marcus Wilson. Is there a Marcus Wilson? No, Marcus Wilson. Okay. Now we have a last one. Marcus Wilson gave somebody a chance, and that is Charles De Ferris. Wow. <laughs> Uncanny. All right. That's yours. Yep. And that's the letter. Thank you. Okay. It's funny. Bo both Charles and Taya came together and they both wrote their tickets at the same time. I promise I shuffled them. You saw. All right. Uh, so I just want to say uh, one last thing. Freedom Box uh, is supported by the Freedom Box Foundation where I work. We're a nonprofit. We like to travel to conferences. We like to do giveaways. We like to spread freedom. So if you can, please consider donating. All right, so now we can do some, some questions. There's the contact info if you want to follow up, but we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. So please do. We actually have a question here first from the uh, IRC channel. Okay. So the dose asks, how does the Freedom Box manage HA? HA? Yes, sir. All right, uh, my colleague Daniel Ganuchev uh, works with me at the Freedom Box Foundation. He's the one who specializes in cybersecurity and the uh, the software development itself. So I'll, I'll defer to him and let him answer that question. Um, yeah, I don't think he has anything to offer in terms of uh, the high availability. Uh, I think uh, that is part of the trade-off that the VM has to make. It's a huge source of services. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That being said, uh, we have found some spikes in the system. That being said, we. Right, okay, so uh, to, to uh, recap what I basically said, I don't think we have anything special to, to, for, for high availability. It, really, it is just the one device. Um, but that being said, it seems to be pretty reliable and it is targeted for individuals. Uh, so if it does go down, it's just affecting one person or a small group of people. Um, so yeah, that's all, all, I, all there is about that really. Okay. No, I don't know. No plans for clustering. I think that that's out of scope. Um, can a group of friends back each other up so that if one server goes down, they all are mirrored and are still available? Uh, well, we do have, uh, we do have, well, we obviously we are, we're keen on making backup work. Um, I don't think we have anything in particular to ease, uh, make it easy for backups to be stored on other Freedom Boxes, but that certainly, that certainly is on the wish list. Yeah, l l let me add to that. There is one of our developers in Europe who's actually working on that, that question. Uh, how can we find a way to make the backup of your data social so that someone else can hold on to well, it? I'm not R talking backup. I'm talking high availability. Ah, high availability. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I think there's another question. There's kind of a comment. Uh, I think you've got the wrong DOS version on your initial slide. Really? Uh, okay. That, okay. You're, you're, you're five. Five is a very new version of DOS. I All started right. On, I started on 3.x. Oh, yeah? On the 64K IBM PC with two floppies. Actually, the two floppies was an upgrade. It started with a single uh, 180K. But uh, the uh, other thing I would say is in some ways the Internet sort of cut, led to the mass media thing uh, I don't know how many people here even remember the good old days of the bet of the bulletin board system where everybody had their home computer running a server that you dialed into and connected to and you probably only had one or two people online at a time and then they would shut down and call each other up and pass mailbags back and forth uh, for a couple of hours every night uh, and that was very decentralized but it was also kind of slow and cumbersome uh, and when the internet came along, flip side, if your freedom box is all you're using it for is to go to fake book and bird blabber, uh, you're still going to be getting manipulated and everything. Yep, yep. So there's a hazard there that it might not be the solution people are looking for. I hope it is. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, thanks for the correction. Um, I got that, the, the caption for that picture from Wikipedia, actually. It was in Wikimedia Commons. So I'm going to go back and make a contribution and correct them on that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and on the, the, the second point, uh, you're right. If people use Facebook, uh, after they have a Freedom Box, they haven't really uh, improved their conditions at all. And that's not something we would, we would recommend. So you're, you're absolutely right about that. Any other questions? Um, communities, how that, that worked out on a technological level. Were they connecting through the internet to get to the freedom boxes or were they connecting more directly to the freedom boxes and then possibly to the internet or just what was like the network like, if that makes any sense? Yeah, okay, good question. So uh, I'll repeat for the people listening in the stream. Adam asked well, what the, 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 the technical infrastructure looked like for those, uh, those cases in rural India. So there are really two ways to approach having a network of freedom boxes in a developing village. Right? The first way is you have a central tower that's connected to the internet through a telecom, and you use that central tower as your Wi-Fi router, which shares the data, uh, and sh sorry, shares the internet connection with all of the other devices in the, in the village. And all of those devices in the village are going to be accessing their services through the Freedom Box interface. That's the first way. The second way involves uh, doing something called uh, mesh networking. Now, mesh networking isn't something that's available by default out of Freedom Box, but it's something that people have experimented with. Um, if you have a mesh network, then the Freedom Boxes can in independently talk to each other, right? And this is a way that you can avoid having the dependence on a telecom. But if you do that, the only information that, and, and data that the Freedom Boxes have access to are the ones that are already on their storage. So you can't fetch anything from Wikipedia. You'd have to download Wikipedia and use what you have. Uh, so that's the answer to the question. Now, specifically what each of those 12 villages looks like, uh, a lot of them have uh, towers that they put up, posts that they put up with uh, some kind of networking hardware that can share the signal so that it's not just uh, uh, a Raspberry Pi or a Lime 2, but it's instead uh, a, a, a kind of heavy equipment and they're putting their uh, Freedom Box hardware on old desktops that nobody uses. Um, bear in mind, this is in a context where people can't afford to just buy uh, any old hardware. So they will find old computers, and people will donate them to, 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 to these activists. And because Freedom Box is hardware neutral, you can install Freedom Box on just about anything, and they put the, syst they, they put the operating system on those uh, old desktops. They're also always accepting donations for old hardware, so uh, you know, we can put you in touch with someone if you want to find a way to help out. All right. Any other questions? Hello. Hi. Um, I do a lot of things in Latin America, and in a lot of Latin American countries, it's a very high import duty on any type of electronics or products. So a Raspberry Pi in Brazil, as an example, instead of costing $35, will often retail for $150. Oh, wow. We are doing a project called Caninas Lucas. It's a nonprofit producing 
uh, Raspberry Pi like computers through the University of Sao Paulo, a nonprofit. Okay. And so we have something with twice as much RAM, it's got two gigabytes. Wow. It runs two to three times faster than a Raspberry Pi, wow. it has USB 3, and it has uh, 16 gigabytes of flash right on, the, right on the board. So I have your business card. You can run, but you can't hide. I will get you a couple of these, okay, so that you can test your software on it. Yeah. Uh, I also want to tell you that DebConf is going to be in Curitiba, Brazil, yep. July the 14th through the 28th. Uh, please come down there, and you know maybe we can get some more stuff done. Yeah, absolutely. We'll chat. We'll chat. Hi, I just have a question about uh, say you uh, install an app on your Freedom Box like uh, MediaWiki. Yep. Um, I'm wondering like ha how it will get updates. Like, uh, will, will it get updates like from you guys? Like, will you patch it or uh, ha how's that going to work? Good question. So there's a question about how any of your applications will be getting updates uh, once you install them on your Freedom Box. All right. So. Freedom Box is a Debian pure blend. That means that all of, all of the software in the system comes from the Debian ecosystem. Freedom Box, the package, is actually just a web user interface, uh, um, a web-based user interface that puts all of these things within the reach of a point and click. Uh, but the packages themselves are still being managed by Debian maintainers. So if there's an update to MediaWiki, we're going to get it because it's a Debian package. My Debian laptop is getting updates to its software in the same way that my Debian-based Freedom Box gets updates. So that means that we're actually benefiting from the contributions of hundreds and thousands of uh, Debian developers who are pushing patches towards us. That's one of the re reasons it was really good that we became a, a Debian system in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, just wanted to get detailed a little, a little bit. Um, there's two features I can think of that, that would go a long way to address you know, what people are using social media and, and you know, what we want to get them away from. Right. And one is file sharing, mm -hmm. and the other is um, events, like creating an event, sending invitations, and managing reminders, and that sort of thing. So I was wondering if you had thought about what sort of applications would address yeah. those in, do you have something in place now or in the in plan yeah. for the future for, for addressing those specific features? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So um, in case the people in the chat and the, the stream didn't hear, there's a question about how we can replace the services of social media, including uh, file sharing and event organizing with Freedom Box. So with file sharing, uh, we have options. The one that we support right now that we recommend is called uh, Synthing. Synthing uh, is a server software that you can put on your Freedom Box so that you can put your files on your Freedom Box and download the Synthing app on your uh, desktop or mobile phone and uh, access your Freedom Box once you have the uh, credentials and just uh, have synchronized files going back and forth between your devices. Uh, that's a good way to replace Google Docs. So that's one option that we have. Now, it's not, uh, it's not perfect. One of the uh, drawbacks to the Freedom Box system is there isn't an easy way to share one file at a time. We had an app called Coquico that we uh, supported for that reason, but it, it, there were some issues with it, so we decided we're going to try to find a way to integrate that into the system our own way so that you can share a file one at a time instead of emailing a photo to yourself so that you can move it from your phone to your laptop. So that, that, that's, that's the first answer. Second question is about how we can coordinate uh, events outside of Facebook and outside of Eventbrite. Uh, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, so in order for us to find a way to coordinate events, we need a Debian-based event organizing software that uh, we can install on a server. I have to think that that wouldn't be impossible to write. It may, may take a while to get it into the Debian system, because Debian is like that, but that has to be fairly straightforward. So if somebody writes that, or if anybody knows of any uh, event organizing software, write to me, and I'll do what I can to uh, see if we can put this in the system. <coughs> Thanks for the question. Okay, so we, uh, we've hit our time. Thanks, everyone, for coming.